my soul be still and do not fear though winds of change may rage tomorrow God. hello and welcome to Wokingham and baptist church service online for today whoever you are and wherever you are connecting with us from it's great to have you today we are thinking about how to cultivate calm and stillness and how this can help us let go of our anxiety and then enable us to think clearly and function well in stressful situations. This is a topic taken from one of the chapters in Brené Brown's book, The Gifts of Imperfection. The book that we're using to help us explore how we, as imperfect human beings, might, with God's help, learn to live full and fruitful lives. Lives full of courage, self-compassion and love. And lives that reflect who we are as children of God and as followers of Jesus. But before we take a look at this topic, let's take a moment to be still and to give God all that is on our hearts today. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to stop for a moment and give you our full attention. We come with many things on our hearts and in our minds. Some of us are full of joy, grateful that spring is here and that there is light at the end of the COVID tunnel. Others of us are anxious about the coming weeks and months as the country opens up and the children return in person to school. We place everything on our hearts and in our minds into your hands today, knowing that you love us and you walk alongside us. Fill our hearts with peace, we pray. Amen. There's no doubt that each of us, however young or experienced in years we are, has uh, experienced stress and anxiety, nervousness and worry uh, because of the stuff going on in our lives, and particularly this year. We may have uh, had to make some really tough decisions and um, we're still not quite sure if they were the right ones. Many of us have probably already found some things that we can do that help us reduce our anxiety and our stress levels and keep a clear head so that we can make important decisions. But just to help us to think about these things a little bit more, we're going to have a quick quiz. Now, I know some of these answers perhaps might not be the sorts of things that you would normally consider doing, but let's try. Uh, just go with it. So, if you're particularly anxious about something, would you sit and stroke your cat, if you've got one, or go for a long walk with your dog? Okay, if you played a musical instrument, um, some of you I know do, do you think you would play your musical instrument to de-stress? or listen to the music of your favourite band or genre? And would that be quiet or loud? Interesting. How about this one? Would you go for uh, a cycle ride or a paddle down the river in a canoe? Would you do lots of digging and planting in the garden? Or would you prefer to find a quiet riverbank and go fishing? Perhaps you're the energetic sort of a person who likes playing sport. Um, so would you play tennis or football? Or both or neither? <laughs> Maybe you've got a particular sport that you enjoy. If you've had a particularly stressful day, 
at school or at work? Would you de-stress by having a long soak in the bath or playing your favourite computer game? And finally, do you react to stress by getting fiery and a bit explosive? Or do you stay calm and clear-headed? People de-stress in different ways. We've all got different personalities and likes, different things that calm us down. Jesus led a busy and at times stressful life. And we read in the Bible that he often sought out quiet moments in boats on lakes or on solitary walks up hills to pray with his father. But sometimes, he wasn't able to do this. And today, in our reading, and through the monologue that follows, we see Jesus being confronted with a difficult decision that has life or death consequences. Let's take a look at what he does. Today's reading is taken from John chapter eight, verses two to 11. At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the Lord and the Pharisees brought in a woman who had been caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women now, what do you say? They were using the questions as a trap in order to have a basis of accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write in the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to cast a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away, one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. I was dragged to the temple courts, a very public humiliation. The men charged towards a crowd of people and they threw me on the ground. Then one of them shouted, hey teacher, this woman was caught in adultery. The law of Moses says she is to be stoned. What do you say? I looked at the scene in front of me. In the center of the crowd stood a man I was beginning to realise what was going on. This must be Jesus, the teacher who healed people. Simon had spoken of him. He didn't like him. He was attracting a lot of tension and the Pharisees hated him. They wanted to get rid of him. He was too popular and he had no respect for them or their position. I could feel that hate now as I lay half naked, trembling in the dust. I was being used again to catch this man out. These men were prepared to kill me to get to him. I had never given Jesus much thought when Simon spoke of him. I was too caught up with the excitement of the affair. Now it seemed my life was in his hands. It was a hopeless situation. This man was a good man. He changed lives uh, for those who were suffering through no fault of their own. And here I was in front of him because of my own wickedness. He'd have no time for someone like me. I looked up slowly, dreading to see his face looking back at me at what could only be contempt. But he wasn't looking at me. 
He was looking at them. The men. The men that surrounded me. They were picking up rocks in, and in anticipation. Jesus watched them for a while, but then said nothing. He just turned and crouched down and started writing in the dust with his finger. The men around me were infuriated now and just shouted louder. The law says she should be stoned. What do you say? What would he say? I thought. I was numb with fear. Eventually, he straightened up and calmly said, if any one of you is without sin, let him cast the first stone. Then he turned his back on them again and continued writing in the dust. Silence, uncomfortable silence. I closed my eyes and waited for the impact of that first stone but nothing came. There was muttering. I couldn't make out the words. I was starting to sweat now and my heart was racing. I said a prayer, I don't know who to. Still nothing. Eventually I raised my head to face my accusers. Some of them looked, some of them looked murderous. Some of them kicked the ground in frustration. Rocks were being passed from hand to hand but none were thrown at me. I bowed my head again in exhaustion. And as I did, I heard the thud of the stones hitting the dust. One by one, these angry men turned and left the scene until it was just me and the healer man still writing in the dust. It was then that the tears began to fall. Tears of shame and relief. My bruised body ached with the shock of being so close to death. This man had saved me, but I had no words to say. I felt numb, embarrassed, exhausted. Once again, Jesus straightened up and turned. This time he looked at me. He really looked at me. And then he spoke. Where are they now? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I wonder what God drew your attention to as you listened to the reading read so helpfully by Faye and the monologue performed so beautifully by Anna. Did you focus in on the woman and the experience that she was having to endure in front of the crowd? Were you drawn toward the teachers of the law and the Pharisees and starting to think about their motives and their behaviour? Or was your attention drawn to Jesus, to the way that he acted and the things that he did and didn't do? Or maybe as you were listening, you found yourself picturing the scene from the perspective of one of the crowd who'd been listening to the teachings of Jesus until the arrival of the Pharisees with the woman and you were there watching the events unfolding. Most of the time, when we reflect on this story, we focus in on the impact of Jesus's actions and words on the woman, on how his encounter with her and his compassion for her and decision not to, in the circumstances, condemn her, gave her another chance. And also on Jesus's challenge to her to consider her actions and change her ways. The monologue that you heard a few moments ago actually goes on a little more to explore some of these, but Jackie, who wrote it, 
kindly let me stop it at the point that we did for today. If you'd like to see the full version, do click on the link in the YouTube description of this service. Today, though, I'd like us to focus a little bit more on Jesus, on how he was able to act in a calm and wise and caring manner, even when he was placed in the really difficult position of having to publicly decide on the fate of this woman whilst being very aware that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law had it in for him and were looking for anything that they could to use against him. The day started well for Jesus. He arrived at the temple courts at dawn after spending time on the Mount of Olives, a place he often went to be alone, probably to pray. And he settled down to teach the crowd. But then out of nowhere comes this commotion and Jesus is interrupted from his teaching and confronted by the Pharisees and the teachers of the law with this woman, insisting that he tell them what to do with her. This gives Jesus a problem. The law of Moses, as the accusers had pointed out, requires the law be stoned to death, along with the man that she'd been caught with, although he seems conspicuously absent from the scene, doesn't he? Anyway, so if Jesus says that this woman should not be stoned, then they can bring charges against him for subver sub subverting the Mosaic law. But if he says that she should be stoned, his decision would cost him the support of the ordinary Jewish people, many of whom would be offended by Jesus strictly adhering to this law, a law that from some of the reading I've been doing this week doesn't seem to have been really enforced at this time. And a decision to stone the woman might also bring Jesus into conflict with the Roman authorities, who, at this particular time, were the only ones with the legal authority to exercise capital punishment, that is, put to death people. So, Jesus was therefore in an impossible situation, or so it seems. A situation that I'm sure would have actually given him great cause to be worried and anxious. A situation that really could have got him arrested. So he therefore has to consider very carefully what to do. He could have had a full-blown argument with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law in front of all those witnesses and accused them of using this woman to try and trap him. A sort of fight back response to the danger he was facing. But he didn't do that. Instead, Jesus recognised that he needed some time to think. I don't know about you, but if I'm facing a tough decision, I need time to think too. I struggle to process complex things quickly and on the spot. And I need a moment to gather my thoughts, to think through the circumstances and the consequences and then I'm ready to speak. And this is what we see Jesus doing here. He's using the writing down on the floor as a way of taking a moment. We don't know what he wrote. Whatever it was doesn't seem to have thrown fuel on the fire and angered the Pharisees and teachers of the law any more than they were already, obviously. So it probably wasn't something too controversial. He may have simply been doodling, possible. It doesn't really matter. But this simple act of writing on the ground was a way of giving him time to think. Yes, the Pharisees were getting more and more frustrated waiting for an answer, but Jesus didn't seem to care about that. He wanted to make the right decision. He knew that the situation could escalate and very, very easily get out of hand, proving disastrous for both the woman and for him. He needed to be calm and create a clearing in his mind, space to think, to gain some perspective, a space of stillness, a space to pray, to ask God for wisdom. 
and he needed to react well and not from a heightened emotional state. Only when Jesus was ready did he stop writing, straighten up and respond to the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. And his response is genius. In the simple phrase, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. He turns the focus from the behaviour of the woman onto the behaviour of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. He's answered their question, but not by incriminating himself. Instead, all eyes are now on who will throw the first stone. But nobody does. Each one of them knowing that they cannot. I wonder if you've got a way of creating a clearing in your own mind. What is it that you do if you need to make a difficult decision? If you're going through a situation that's particularly stressful, perhaps you go for a walk. Jesus often did. Or maybe you focus on some breathing exercises to calm you down. I wonder if Jesus did this too. Or you might have another way of cultivating calm and stillness and creating space to think and pray, such as the sorts of things that we had in our quiz earlier. Do you do any of these things regularly? Even when you're not under pressure to make a decision or feeling stressed or anxious? Jesus regularly sought out moments to reflect and pray and rest. And these enabled him to think clearly to make wise decisions and to react well under pressure and to live a life not consumed by anxiety about what was going to happen to him in the future, but live a life that focused on making a difference to those around him, a life of love that challenged wrong behaviour and drew people towards God. I wonder if you can think of a time when you've acted perhaps wrongly where you could have done with acting in a calm and a still manner, but your emotions got the better of you and the fieriness that was within you came out. I know I have. When we're worried about something or we're feeling threatened by something, our anxiety rises, doesn't it? And our emotions often overtake us. And here in the temple court, and knowing that the Jewish leaders were looking for a way to kill him, Jesus' emotions could quite easily have overtaken him too. But instead, he leans into God, drawing on the resources of calm and stillness that he's already cultivated in his life. And he turns the situation around. And in the process, changes the life of a woman forever. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the example of Jesus. We thank you for the way that he acts in difficult circumstances with a calm stillness and deep wisdom, bringing perspective and challenge in a difficult space. Help us to prioritise time like Jesus did to cultivate calm and stillness in our own lives so that when we face difficult decisions or go through times of anxiety and worry, we won't respond in an unhelpful, emotionally heightened way, but we will be able to react well, taking a moment to stop and pray and creating space for you to speak into our situation. Help us to trust that you will guide, that you will take us through whatever challenge we might be facing now and in the future. Help us to know that you, our God, are there for us and with us. You are trustworthy and we do not need to be shaken by the things that we're going through. Amen. 
Let's continue to reflect on this theme by sharing in a song together, which the band will lead for us. The song is Still My Soul Be Still. soul be still and do not fear though winds of change may rage tomorrow God is at your side no longer dread the fires of unexpected sorrow God you are my God and I will trust in Temptations flaming arrows. God, you are my God, and I will trust in you and not be shaken. Lord of peace, renew a steadfast spirit within me to from Psalm 62 as we come to the end of our time together. My soul find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I shall not be shaken. My salvation and my honour depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Let's pray. Father God, as we take time this week to find ways to cultivate calm and stillness, 
Help us to keep the example of how Jesus spoke and acted in difficult circumstances in our minds. And remember to turn to you when we are worried or anxious and have difficult decisions to make. This week, we particularly pray for all parents of school-aged children, the staff at schools and the children themselves, as many get used to once again being back together as a community. Help everyone stay calm and enjoy the experience of being back together. And we pray for protection from COVID for all of our local schools. Amen. If you'd like to reflect more on this theme of cultivating calm and stillness and letting go of anxiety, some questions will come up on the screen in just a moment. Why not take some time to consider them, either now or at some point this week? A blessing as we close. May you find the calm that you need in times of stress. May you find the stillness that you need to see tricky situations clearly. May you experience God's peace as you face uncertainty. And may you know that God is with you today and every day. Amen. <laughs>